of the passages not read today comes from the Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. When Jeremiah received the call to be a spokesperson for God, he was young. He was a young teenager, maybe the same age as Mary when she had Jesus, 14 or 15 years of age. But before he could use his age as an excuse, God said to him, no, you want to be, you're going to be my prophet. If you're in trouble, I'll give you the words, but you're it. Uh, I think Jeremiah had a very difficult time because uh, he had a very difficult message to present to the people because the people of God, the chosen people, had used their chief, they are being chosen as privilege rather than as the ability to serve. And so much of what he had to say was something that was negative to those people of God. And some of his writings talk about his anguish and his pain and how many times he was attacked verbally for what he was trying to do to be faithful. Now, I also was a teenager when I first got the call for ministry. I was in my small church in the Bronx, and I had a young pastor who had graduated from Drew University in Methodist school. And I was very active in the church. The church was home for me. The church was like a womb for me, because I was a very shy child. I had a speech impediment. I didn't have a lot of friends. The church became a place where I received an important word that has been part of my ministry all of these 50 plus years. And that is the word was acceptance. As I was, I was accepted fully. I cannot tell you how powerful that is. So I said, well, I really hadn't thought of that. Nobody in my family had ever gone to, to uh, college. Uh, my mother had to drop out when she was a senior in high school to become the main breadwinner as her father had a stroke. My sister graduated high school, went by on into Sears and Lubbock, where she had a long career, 48 years working for Sears and Lubbock. I told my pastor, Dick Monkman, that I was gonna wait a year and work in Sears and then go to college. He said, if you do that, you will never go. <laughs> so I did go on to college. And there I met a young woman from the Student Christian Association, which was a YMCA-based organization. She had gone to Union Seminary in Manhattan. And with leadership in college of being involved with a Christian organization, I decided also to try out going to uh, Union Seminary, which I did. And the rest of it, of course, as you know, is history because here I am today speaking to you as a retired pastor. So uh, I was loved into life by the church, and the church has been my love all these years. Uh, that is for sure. I have been preaching for three Sundays in a row, which is very unusual for me in my retirement. So I've been using one of the scriptures uh, from the same book each week. Now I'm going to give you a little background because some of you may not know this, uh, about how, how pastors choose their, their scriptures to read from. When I first started out, I, after my second year of seminary, I went out to Michigan, and where I became a pastor of two small churches. One had 69 members, one had 19 members. I was there for two reasons. One, to have a church to serve and practice for my seminary, but also to attend Kalamazoo and Kalamazoo Western Michigan University that had a studying program in which I learned how to be a bit more fluent, although occasionally I was still had that problem. But so did many other famous people, so I'm not worried about that. But while I was out there, I was more of a topical preacher. That meant that I would take things like peace and forgiveness and uh, God's kingdom and, and then you know, use it as a theme and then began to weave scriptures in that would justify and explain that theme. That's called topical. Another style of preaching, of course, is to preach the lectionary, which is also a good way to go because many times pastors doing their own topics pick the same things over and over again, the same themes that they want to kind of drill home to people. Lectionary covers the entire span of what is Christianity all about. All the seasons, all the holidays, all the special events are covered in the three-year term. We are in right now the third term. This is the, the C term. And the gospel is, is Luke, that is primarily there for this uh, lectionary readings. There's also always a psalm, which was the hymnody of the Hebrew people. There was always an Old Testament passage. It could have been a prophet reading. It could be one of the books of history, the Kings of Samuel. It could have been uh, books of wisdom, like the Proverbs. 
Well, it could have been uh, the prophets uh, as well. So before doing the sermon today, I did a little check to make sure that uh, Pastor Joseph did not use one from Luke, uh, nor did Pastor Jill the last week. So today, my friends, don't, again, don't panic here, I am giving three sermons. Rather than three points to one sermon, I'm giving three sermons based on passages from Luke. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> I'll take the best of that, I hope, and be able to, to, to present it to you. One of the things about being a, a person who does topics is that in my very first church in Michigan, I awoke on April 4th, 1968, I'd been there a few months, and the radio was announcing that Martin Luther King Jr. had been killed, assassinated in, in Memphis. That was Thursday morning on April 4th. On April 7th, I had to preach a sermon, and it was Palm Sunday, of all things, Palm Sunday. And so, in my sermon, I was comparing Martin Luther King Jr. march into Memphis to give support to the workers who were striking with the march of Jesus into Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday. And I wasn't saying Martin Luther King was Jesus, but just making that, you know, a comparison. And one lady in the church decided that was enough, and she walked out, and she never came back. <laughs> that was it. There's always a danger in trying to, to speak about the gospel and try to tie in the Bible and the newspaper, the Bible and life as it is today. But I wanted to explore the text couple of weeks back, the first thing I read in commentaries was, <clears throat> this is a very difficult text to approach, because it offers a very different view of Jesus that preachers seldom discuss. And that's true. Because we think of Jesus as one who comes to unite, as one who comes to love everyone, one who be supportive of family. One that brings peace. My goodness, every time he came to the people in his, both his life and in his resurrection, his first words of peace I give to you. But he also said, not as the world gives, uh, do I give to you. Not peace, which means at all costs, which means basically don't make waves, don't be a troublemaker. If anything, Jesus was certainly that. He was a troublemaker, a rebel rouser. In his first reading in his hometown of Nazareth, picked up the scroll of Isaiah, he read the prophecy and said, today this has been fulfilled in your presence. And he all cheered, he cheered, it was good, good news. But he went on to give two examples of how privilege was not the important thing in this. Uh, he gave two examples of people who were outside the, the Jewish community who received healing and salvation and not any of the people who were Jewish. Well, this was not good news to them. And so they, they tried to, uh, they didn't walk out on him, he walked out on them, and they tried to capture him and throw him off a cliff. That's the danger of uh, speaking God's word sometimes. Now, some other background information about scripture, why it's so hard. And I think that every church should have active Bible study. I know this church has been somewhat lamenting the fact that we don't have a lot of children uh, in, in Sunday school. But an important part of faith formation, as some people have used that phrase in UCC church, is knowing what the Bible is all about. And to read the Bible with understanding and knowledge and commentary and share among people what is going on. Because you all have different approaches to coming to scripture. When I was in seminary, which was a rather uh, liberal seminary, I had a dear friend of mine who went to the same classes, had the same professors, and came out as right wing as you could possibly think of. Because we all have our own biases. We all have our own way of looking and seeing and hearing what was going on. In a book I found on my shelf a few weeks back, called 10 Things Your Pastor Wants to Tell You, the Reverend Oliver Buzz Thomas, who's a Baptist minister and also a constitutional lawyer, specialized in relationships between the church and the state, wrote the following, and I love this phrase, and I hope you hold on to it. All of us read scripture as if we were looking into a well, into a well. If we're not careful, 
We see only our reflection, and we miss the water entirely. The reflection, of course, is our own biases, our own life story that we bring to the scripture. But if that gets in the way of what is the living water in the well, then we are in trouble. In this passage this morning that began, Jesus is not talking to the general population. He is talking in this section to the disciples. Time and time he had told them what would be the cost of discipleship. It is not easy to follow me. I will have no place to lie down on my head. He has told them, you know. He has warned them that you can't take some of the usual things you want to do and push back what you are called to do as a follower of mine. You must act immediately and, and to follow me. This is not always easy for, for people to do, not at all. In fact, uh, a lot of them would say, two of, the, two of the, the best disciples, James and John, would be fighting over who might be sitting at the best seat in God's kingdom. We'll get to that a little bit later on in, in Sermon 3, which is for today. But this is still Sermon 1. The other problem we have is this mug that I have. OMG, no, I don't believe in taking God's name in vain, so oh my gosh. That's not what I said. I have a Bible at home, and there were many Bibles like this, where you get to the four Gospels, it's called the, lead, the Red Letter Edition. That is, all the uh, words that Jesus speaks are in red, so you know exactly what is the words of Jesus, the rest of it is in black. And some people will say, well, that's the most important part, so I skip over, but if you do that, you oftentimes miss the context. Who is he talking to? What is happening around him? Why is he saying these things? How are we to respond to it? All those things are extremely important when it comes to understanding the scripture. And that's what we have to do. <clears throat> he says, I bring, I wish I could bring fire upon the earth. And he speaks about baptism. He's talking about his own life. His own life, his own experience of, of, of God in his life. Uh, fire oftentimes is seen as something which is destructive, but it can also be healing, it can be purifying. A good forest fire sometimes is needed in order to make get away the brush so that other trees and other life can, can take place. We speak of a person putting a fire under somebody to get them to be more enthusiastic, to become more involved in the life of the church, and that's important to do. If you want to have a little touch of more water in the well, I encourage you just to read someday, Matthew 5 through 7. It's called a Sermon on the Mount. Luke has some of the same things in it, but he has it in different sections. Sermon on the Mount is a, is a sermon that says the law doesn't go far enough. Jesus did not come to, to uh, end the law, but rather to get to the deep spirit of the law. So things in the Matthew, just to give you a few drops of water this morning. You have heard it said, but I say to you, you should not murder, but I say to you, whoever is angry and says, you fool, <laughs> risk their soul. Uh, you've heard it say, uh, if, you, if you're not, you should not swear falsely, which means tell lies about somebody else. He says, but don't swear at all. Don't swear at all. You want to love your neighbor as yourself and hate your enemy, but no, he says just the opposite. You shall love your neighbor, and you shall love the enemy as well. Hard to do, hard to do. That's putting a fire under us, but it helps us get past our own reflections and see the living water that is in the well. Okay, Sermon 2. Not read this morning, but in Sermon 2, we have Jesus teaching again in the synagogue. And a woman comes in and she's been crippled for 18 years. She has a disease that keeps her bent over. He stops what he's doing and he heals this woman and she straightens up and gives praise to God. Wow, that is so powerful. You mentioned about Friday being Women's Day, you know. If you look over the account of Jesus, so many times, Women played an extremely important part of his life. There was a woman that ministered to him with anointing him when he was near his death. There's a woman at the well who 
immediately be confronted with God's truth and God's love, and he did so with love and, and compassion. There's a woman who wanted to listen to the pearls of wisdom that he was speaking, and at that time, in his own growth and development, he said, I'm sorry, but I don't give good food to swine. She says, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs under the table. He learned from her. He could learn from her. In his human form, he had to learn what was more fully his ministry and what it was supposed to be. Well, you would think people would be happy. If someone came into this room right now and was crippled, and somebody here had the ability to physically heal that person, you would be rejoicing. But the leader of the synagogue was complaining. He said, that's work on the Sabbath. That's work on the Sabbath. So I said, woman, six days you can come here. Six days of the week you can come here. Why on the Sabbath? You know, don't heal on the Sabbath. And in response to that, Jesus says, you know, when I've said this many times in the past, when you point your finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at you. That's what he does to the Pharisees. He says, look, you hypocrites. Wouldn't you release an oxen? Wouldn't you release a donkey? Wouldn't you feed that donkey? You do it on the Sabbath. I know you do. So we should rejoice in the fact that this person who had been sick for so long has now rejoiced. And so the up theme for all of this would be simply this. There is no wrong time to do what is right. There is no wrong time to do what is right. And Sabbath, our idea of Sabbath has changed. You know, we know that in the Bible story, God worked on six days and rested on the seventh. But we know that time was meant different things back in those days. It wasn't seven days the world created. Science today would tell us that. But the truth of it is that we all need to rest from our labors. We all need a time that we're not just human beings and doings. We are, we are also just spiritual people. If we don't take time for our spirituality, then we're going to wear out very quickly in our desire to do what is right and to follow God. You must have some kind of Sabbath. One time, a few years back, I was having surgery, which wasn't too good, and so I had to have a second surgery to help repair the first surgery. It happened on a Sunday. Uh, the doctor worked on the Sunday. I'm here because the doctor worked on a Sunday. There was never a time that it's wrong to do what is right. Today's sermon brings us to what was read about uh, Jesus. Now, the first sentence is important. The Pharisees are watching him very closely because they know this guy is a rebel rouser. A troublemaker. He may be smart, he may be religious, but they had his suspicions about him. It's like I suppose if you were going to a neighborhood and you were a stranger and you were of a different color, different nationality, different race, different language, and you walked into the store, and all of a sudden the clerk is doing this <laughs> up and down the aisles, watching you very carefully. Because you're a stranger, they're not sure they can trust you. It's a terrible way to be, but it is a reality. You know, that's just the way it is. Uh, if you walk into a movie theater and you're wearing a trench coat and you have a big package, you will be watched very carefully. Very carefully indeed. That's how they are watching Jesus. And so he walks in he too, and he realizes that there's a banquet going on and people are jostling for the best seats. <laughs> Now, this is the reason for this, because it's a fellowship time. If you want to be next to people you know and love, that's important. Any kind of macro meal is like that. But also sometimes it's a matter of influence. Oh, gee, I can get a contract with the person over there. Let me try to nudge over to him and sit down and maybe we can talk some business uh, during, the, during the meeting, during the dinner. You know, It's a natural thing to do. When you go into a church, you look around, going to try to find, to sit near somebody who you know, looks like you, or maybe has a family, if they have a family, or an older person maybe, you know, you, your kind is just part of being human beings, you know. And so that's what was happening. But they were trying to choose the best seats, and he says, be humble about this, you know. It's much better to be invited to come closer 
This would be embarrassing to say, excuse me, but you're in my seat, I'm the vice president. <laughs> you really don't want to be in that position, no matter what your party affiliation, you don't want to be in that position. But then he goes on beyond that. Every time you have a banquet, there ought to be a wild card. <laughs> now, sometimes it's very interesting you know, about how one should do that. Let me read for you an example. <clears throat> 20 tips to throw the best dress-free dinner party ever by Sophia Green says the number one thing to do when throwing a dinner party is to pick a good group. Choose friends who get along well, have similar interests, and have at least some things in common. If you're looking to spice things up with a wild card invitee or two, make sure they fit in and will make the rest of your guests uncomfortable. When we have a gathering of Christians, we Fight and encourage wild cards. Any wild cards home today watching this and doing this right now? Hey, you're invited. You are to be here. This is your time. This is your place. We love you. In the following parable, not read today, going on in the same chapter of Luke, it talks about how a man invited people to come to the banquet, but they were all so busy. They had this to do, that to do, that to do. So he sends his servants out to the wilds <laughs> and brings in every possible person who in the lowest totem pole of, of social ability and says, come to the banquet. Come to the banquet. There are some people who treat Christianity and the Bible in a fundamental, literalist way. I think we want to risk doing that. I think it's a big risk. It's good to study the Bible in community, where you have different points of view being expressed and where the uh, image of you diminishes because of the image of the many who are made in, in God's eyes. So I think it's extremely important to have that aspect of it, you know. Because the reality is that sometimes all we see in the well is our own reflection. And we miss the living water that is in there. A serious study of scripture brings us to the living water.